but I used to do a lot of housing stuff. Everyone to Hunter College's first ever decarbonization town hall. Welcome. All right. So glad folks could make it both in person and on Zoom. Um, so my name is Andy Wolf. I'm an assistant professor here at Hunter College. I'm also a member of Sustainability Council. Uh, I work in the biology department, and I care a lot about climate change. I like to think about you know how can we make a difference on this big problem. And so today we're going to start off with uh, we're have a series of talks and interactive events. Um, we're going to start off. I'm going to do an introduction um, about. What is the problem of climate change? Why should we care about this problem? Why is this important to us personally? And then I'm gonna talk, uh, bring it home and talk about uh, what are we doing here at Hunter College and what more could we do? We're then gonna uh, turn it over to Truly Johnson, who's a Hunter College alumnus um, and designer of a uh, board game called Energetic uh, about sustainability that we're gonna talk about uh, today. Uh, Lily is gonna is a current Hunter, Hunter College student and NYPIRG representative. She's gonna talk about her experience and the sort of urgent uh, nature of the climate crisis calls to action. Uh, Ankit from Public Power NY is gonna give us a presentation about um, their work on uh, how energy is distributed. You know, who should control the energy systems of New York? We're gonna have breakout groups where we're gonna talk to each other and have discussions about what we think uh, Hunter College should be doing, what we think we should be doing as a community, as a state, as a nation. Um, then we're gonna, uh, Tom Engadi is gonna come up, who's a, a Hunter College Professor Emeritus of Urban Policy and Planning. And uh, after him, it's gonna, uh, it's gonna be Brad Lander, who is our elected New York City Comptroller. We then have Nancy Romer from Professional Staff Congress Union, so our uh, Teachers Union and Staff Union, um, from the Environmental Justice Working Group, which has been uh, one of the organizers of this event today is working tirelessly to uh, try and do everything they can for climate change. Uh, finally, we have Alex Boris from uh, New York State Assembly, uh, District 73. So that is our district who's going to come up and uh, talk a bit about the climate crisis. So why do we care about climate change? And what is it even? Why is it happening? So uh, this is a slide about uh, how does climate change even get started? So sunlight that hits Earth is mostly reflected back into space. However, sometimes it bounces off the Earth, bounces off the atmosphere, back onto Earth, and gets trapped. And so that's heat being trapped in the Earth. And the composition of the atmosphere turns out to matter a lot for the rate at which sunlight gets trapped or bounces back out to space. So as we emit gases like carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere, that creates uh, an increased layer of gas here that's going to trap these in, just like a greenhouse traps gas inside. Uh, so these are called greenhouse gases, and this basically uh, absorbs and redirects heat radiated by Earth, preventing it from the heat from being lost to space. So we get extra heat that's trapped in Earth as we change the gas composition. So the more carbon dioxide and methane we put in the atmosphere, the faster the Earth heats up. So here is uh, historical carbon emissions, uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, this is going back about almost a million years um, from sort of record, soil records. Um, and you see it goes up, it goes down sometimes. And then here is humans, right at the end here, Industrial Revolution. And then in 2021, here was the observed uh, carbon dioxide concentration in parts per million, sort of highest in recorded uh, history here. Um, we can also make projections. We can think about, okay, well, if we keep doing what we're doing, we don't make any changes, what's it gonna look like going forward? It turns out there's, there's not really a limit to how much we can screw up our atmosphere. We can just keep pumping out more and more carbon into the atmosphere. Um, so if we just, this is a projection for what it would look like in the year 2100 if we do business as usual, if no, if we don't make any changes. So I hope this makes the case that um, it, it's important to make changes. Uh, and why is it important is because uh, it turns out that as the Earth heats up, this leads to real problems in real life. Uh, and this is a graph of natural disasters over time by decade. Uh, so we have floods, mass movements, storms, droughts, extreme temperatures, and wildfires. And you can see the trend here is it's increasing over time. So every decade, the rate of floods goes up. The rate of wildfires goes up. So the reasoning here, wildfires is pretty easy to imagine. As the earth gets hotter, the tinder is drier. It's easier for fires to spread. The number of acres that gets burned goes up. The uh, ability for the wildfire to get started, it's easier. Um, for floods as well, um, as the ice caps melt, that puts more water in this, into the uh, water cycle. And so um, when the water evaporates because of higher heat, we get larger storms, and so this leads to floods and more hurricanes. So it's not um, polar bears in 100 years. It's actually us right now. Um, 
it's an ongoing and exponential problem. It's just getting worse. And the longer we wait, the harder it is to solve it. Um, and, and I want to make a case that affects you personally. Um, the person you are, either on Zoom or in the room, is going to be affected by climate change in your lifetime, if you haven't already. Um, so here's looking another look at wildfires more specifically. So um, this is California wildfires over time, so our acres burn. Um, so this is making the point that as the uh, tinder gets drier, the wildfires can grow more. Um, and we also get um, problems like smoke that gets really severe. So you know the question is, if you're downwind of the wildfire, what happens? Um, so California has a lot of wildfires, but that couldn't happen here, right? And so um, it turns out, sorry, that this definitely can happen here. So you might remember last summer, um, this is a picture of New York City bathed in wildfire smoke that got blown down from wildfires in Canada. Um, this is real pictures of what it looked like as uh, sort of orange skies, hazy stuff. This is not good for our lungs. Um, so there's a lot of studies connecting smoke from smoking to serious diseases, uh, cardiovascular disease, cancers, um, wildfire smoke, also, you can make these same correlations. So as we are bathed in the smoke in our environment, it's not healthy for humans to breathe. Um, this is a real health hazard for people. So we're here at Hunter College, and this is like a big global problem. So what can we do? What can we do, the people here in the room do? Um, you know, it might seem like this problem is so big, there's nothing we can do about it. So what, what are the real steps we can do? Let's look at the energy usage here at Hunter College. So one of the primary sources of carbon dioxide emissions is energy. Um, here's a graph of energy uses. This is smokestack emissions of what the colleges uses are. Um, so here's electricity at the bottom, um, which is made on an increasingly renewable grid. Um, this is where our solar power is to feed into electricity. Then we have gas in red. Um, this is fossil fuels burned locally. So this, uh, Natural gas is a really nice name because it has the word nature in it, and we like nature. But natural gas turned out as a fossil fuel. It's sort of second to uh, oil and coal as being very high emissions. Um, so when we burn natural gas to turn on the lights in this room, or the heat that we feel, um, so we're not cold in at Hunter College, you know, we're burning fossil fuels to do so. Um, so this makes up uh, about half our emissions. Um, we also have steam, uh, which makes up a big chunk of our emissions as well. Um, we're not really going up at Hunter College, which is great year over year in terms of our energy usage, but we're also not really going down. We're just sort of staying flat year over year. Um, so there's a lot more we could do. But, but what could we do? What are the real changes we could make if we wanted to get serious about tackling the climate crisis? Um, so two things we could do. Uh, one is we could decrease our contributions to the climate crisis by replacing our current fossil fuel burning gas system with electrification. So is that possible? Can universities really do stuff like this? Um, can people like, can CUNY do this? Can other schools do this? So here's an example of Stanford University who actually did do this in real life. Um, so what they did is they installed a new um, energy system. Um, this was uh, high voltage substations that receive electricity from the grid instead of burning gas locally or coal locally or oil locally. You can just get electricity from the grid. The grid is not a perfect system that also gets energy from a mix of sources. But as new solar installations are installed, the percentage of the grid that is from renewable energy keeps going up and up and up. And we're not able to access that if we're burning energy locally using fossil fuels instead of getting connected to the city grid, the state grid. Stanford also serves water tanks for um, thermal energy storage. Um, they converted the heat supply of all buildings from steam to hot water. And there's a heat recovery system that takes advantage of the overlap of heating and cooling needs. So this is um, sort of drilling into the ground to do ground-based heat exchange where um, the ground is colder than your building, you dump the heat in the ground, and vice versa, it is when the ground is warmer than your building. Um, so there's a geothermal energy system you can use here as well. There's a lot of um, advances that uh, buildings can, can have, you know. When you lock in new building infrastructure like this, it lasts for, for you know, decades and decades and decades way down the road. So um, changing the way our buildings function is a really important way that we could try and decarbonize. Uh, SESI, the standard Stanford uh, energy system, reduce their emissions by about 68%. So this is a real possible thing that universities can do. Um, so electrification of energy, energy, the university energy system support. UC Berkeley um, also is doing this largely in response to student protests that they were upset that the cogeneration plants were burning gas to power their classrooms. And um, after you know long sets of uh, you know Earth Day protests, they end up getting uh, electrification planning put in place. Um, so the way that energy works at CUNY is CUNY has an energy master plan. 
Uh, there's several projects at Hunter College that have been done. Um, so we are making some progress. There's several that are planned. Um, and this is based on a big study. So basically to address the climate crisis, uh, Clinic formed years of studies about how the energy systems at the various campuses could be improved. So these culminated in the 2023 Energy Master Plan. Um, so there's one for Hunter College and every other uh, university and student system. Uh, it's full of specific implementable ideas for Hunter College. So now we're at the step where we don't uh, need to make more studies on what to do. We have to sort of start implementing these ideas, um, sort of functional ideas of how uh, we could really make a difference on climate change. Um, so there's some that we've already done. So uh, in green here are, um, is the total carbon dioxide uh, equivalent is the units here um, that was reduced. So that's how much we've done so far. Um, so we're taking our steps here. There's a lot that's planned. Um, there's many uh, projects that Hunter College has given the green light to that are planned to do and should be completed in the next few years. Um, there's also a backlog of projects that were identified in the energy master plan that are not planned to happen. Um, that are projects we found that the, the project has been identified by people doing surveys uh, of the built, like not taking a survey, but like look, walking around and looking at the uh, various systems, electrical systems, window systems in the building, but that aren't funded right now. Um, so one thing that could happen is uh, CUNY could make, and you know, Albany could make decisions to fund projects like this to try and decarbonize our campuses. So let's get more specific. So what could Hunter do about climate change? So what's actually in the backlog? So here it is. Um, so here's projects that are in the unfunded backlog, and the size of the bar here is based on how much carbon would be reduced. There's a second variable not shown here, which is the price of these, which is also a factor in deciding which things to do and which things not to do. But just to highlight a few, um, so in the Hunter North building, there's uh, new valves, thermostats, and steam traps that could be installed that would save uh, about 518 uh, carbon uh, dioxide equivalent uh, tons. So there's actually a lot that we could do um, if we have the sort of will to decide these are projects worth doing, these are worth investing in and putting dollars towards. So outside the realm of energy, energy is actually not the only slice of the pie, it's sort of the biggest slice of the pie, but also transportation. So did you know Hunter College owns cars and vans? Um, here's a picture I took of one uh, with a big dent in the side, a Hunter Athletics van. So Hunter College actually owns 23 vehicles. Um, the fleet averages 11 years old. Um, some of these vehicles are damaged, and eventually they're all going to need to be replaced. Over time, cars get old, you need new cars. So as new cars come up, um, we, could, we have sort of a choice. Do we want to buy electric vehicles that are very low emissions, or do we want to buy gas-powered vehicles? When we buy them, you know, these are probably going to be around at least another 11 years on average, um, maybe more. So what do you think? Should Hunter choose to go electric for its fleet? Is this a realistic thing? Um, we talk about it a lot, um, sustainability council and elsewhere. Uh, should Hunter go electric? And there's always concern about having enough charging stations around New York. There's actually a lot of charging stations around New York. Um, you know, there's just actually more charging stations than gas stations in New York City. So for, it's a question of should we choose to go all electric for, for our fleet or not? Um, so charging station anxiety is a real thing. People worry that their car is going to run out of battery. Um, so there's, there's an idea to try and install new EV charging stations for campus. Um, so the standard council put together a transportation survey. Um, so, you know, if you think that electric cars would be a, a nice idea for campus, feel free to take out your phone now and scan the QR code and you take the transportation survey about, um, should, you know, it, it's basically about how do you get to school every day, but, um, you know, part of the motivation for it is should uh, you know should we install EV chargers uh, somewhere nearby? There's also a survey about bicycles. Um, if you're interested in that, there's a separate survey about biking to come to college. So if you're a biker, um, this could be for you. Uh, other steps Hunter is taking. So Hunter is trying to be proactive about this. There's a Green Labs program that me and other people on Sustainability Council have been uh, trying to promote. Um, so I actually in my uh, job, I work at a lab, um, so I have the, my lab in the Belt Research Building, and we really try and do things great. And we try and put together a list of ways that um, science can be done in a more sustainable way here at Hunter College. There's actually a whole bunch of um, ideas and not a lot of labs participating yet. So if you know somebody who works in a lab, we have uh, the ability to sign up here. You can contact greenhunter.cuny.edu to sign up a lab for the Green Labs program or just to learn more. 
There's a lot of practical things we can do in laboratories. So like the freezers can be set to a slightly less cold temperature, and that saves about 30% of our emissions if we just bring our freezers up 10 degrees. The samples inside are just fine. We did it in our lab, and it's not a problem. Um, there's things like closing the fume hood that can reduce energy, because these are just blowing air all the time and they use a tremendous amount of energy. So there's real practical solutions there, too, with the Green Labs program. Um, there's a couple of professors here at Hunter College that run something called the Green Roofs Project. So Alan Fry and uh, Mehdi Harris from Urban Planning and Geography and Environmental Science have been working with New York City Parks Department uh, to see what happens. Can we grow plants on the roof is the basic idea. So they have, um, here's pictures of students taking care of the Green Roof Project. These are sort of test cases, uh, sort of academic test cases that aren't implemented at a broad scale yet. Um, so they have sort of student learning goals. They have a Dozens of students that have learned about environmental field work, how to design experiments, how to learn, you know, does grass or astroturf, um, you know, absorb heat, uh, and, you know, which one is better for, uh, you know, contributions to climate change. Turns out real grass works much better, and there's other plants that work even better than grass. So they look on different roof surfaces, uh, water cycle impacts, and how they can affect water as rainfall happens, because there are ways to make that more efficient. Um, they published a little bit on this project. They'd like to broaden it out to do the different plant species, impact of cool roofs on um, HVAC performance, on how does it make, help the air conditioners work better. Um, they also would love to establish an outdoor sustainability lab here on Hunter College campus. This is mostly out on um, an island in the East River, but we'd like to bring that back here and have it at Hunter College again. Um, finally, uh, Hunter High School is also uh, being involved. So they have a podcast by students um, centered on sustainable, city, uh, sustainable cities. These high school students and college students have a chance to ask experts. They bring on expert guests, and the um, episodes are available online, anywhere you find podcasts. We look for um, ways that the high school curriculum can teach a path to Paris Agreement. So a lot of what we can do in Hunter College as an educational institution is to try and educate, you know, teach people about the climate crisis, kind of like we're doing today, right? How, what can we learn about? Um, what can we do better? And why should we care? Uh, we have some courses at Hunter College as well. There's several courses uh, on sustainability, uh, including one on sustainability and disease. How does climate change impact disease? So there's a lot of educational tools that we have at Hunter College that we can use to try and do education of the climate crisis. It's a really important tool to try and get people to be uh, excited about making a difference. So actually, we're going to hear from some students today. Um, so I'm actually going to ask if anybody has questions about this first part before we turn it over to uh, our alumni and students today. Any questions so far? So what, I, I go for it. No, I just uh, I'm Steve Greenbaum, Physics Department. So every few years, Alan Fry and I teach a course in Tom Sumner on the program called Energy and Environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we 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 cover these these issues. And I'd like to double down on your last, the last part of the presentation on education, uh, which I would also fold into workforce development. Uh, we, we can train our students through uh, the availability of a lot of summer internships at some of the national labs to actually think about careers in, in renewable energy and, and uh, you know, carbon reduction. It's a really great point that education also leads to green jobs, that there are a lot of green jobs out there. This is a huge growing industry. So if you're a college student and you're not sure what you want to do after you graduate, you care about climate change a lot, look around. There's a lot of job opportunities out there in this field. So I'm going to turn it over now to Truly Johnson, who's going to present um, Energetic. Uh, so Truly, come on up, please. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about a project that I worked on uh, feels like a long time ago now, 2018, back before the pandemic, uh, was when this got started. Uh, basically, though, it's a game um, about, it's it's a game about decarbonizing New York City. Um, so basically, the the point, uh, I'll, I'll show you all the, the board. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is a map of New York City. Well, in New York State, this is New York City, and this is all of the space we will need to build all of the renewable energy that could power New York City. Um, so basically, the idea of this game is you're going across this timeline, um, hopefully getting things done by 2035, but it is difficult, and so there's a lot of uh, 
a lot of times when people play it, it will take them longer to get there. Um, but the idea is that as as you go through time, you have to balance the stability of the grid with uh, public opinion and just straight up building a lot of energy. So you can build wind turbines, for example, but they will decrease your grid stability because wind power is variable and sometimes there's a lot of wind and sometimes there's a little. So you need to counteract that with building storage, either through pumped hydro or by doing research. Basically, we have a way of simulating scientific research is that you can get certain cards. And if you get enough of them, then you can have like a research breakthrough and figure out new technologies. Um, so you could eventually figure out how to do hydrogen storage. And then that's another way you can increase stability to counteract the effects of wind power. Um, and for other options, you can build solar, you can build nuclear and um, um, natural gas with carbon capture if you do the science on that too. Um, so I, yeah, realistically, how well that will work is, you know, <laughs> still, uh, yeah, there, there still needs to be a lot of science to be done. Um, and so basically, um, oh, actually, before I get to that next point, um, the idea here is that New York City is pretty critical in terms of decarbonization because we're like a city, we're pretty well off compared to a lot of places um, across the world that are hitting, being hit hard by the effects of climate change. We're a huge city, we have a lot of power that we use, and like we are in a prime position to take the lead as, as a city on decarbonizing and you know being a leader for the rest of the world. Um, so that's why this game is so important because we can map out a way that New York can be an example and can really, you know, it, it's complicated and there's so many factors to take into account, how much things cost, things are expensive, how much things affect public opinion. People don't want wind turbines blocking their view of the water, even though, you know, I don't know, I think wind turbines are nice. And you can paint them colors to prevent birds from flying into them. There's all sorts of things you can do to make them, uh, you know, better. But yeah, um, so it's it's all a big balancing act, but it is possible. And if we can show that New York City can do this, then who can't do it? Everyone can do it, right? If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Um, so yeah, we it's used in a bunch of universities and high schools right now, uh, including Hunter College High School and Brooklyn Tech. Um, and in addition, it can be adapted for other cities and other regions, um, which I think we have done um, to some places. Um, but yeah, that's um, that's energetic. Uh, feel free to, yes. Hi, I'm Douglas Price, uh, Program Manager for the Center for Sustainable Cities. Last night, we hosted a game night down in the West Lobby, and Tuli was one of the, the facilitators there. And we had 28 people playing the game. Um, and had a lot of discussion about climate change um, with Kate Shapira, who was a, a guest. Um, and uh, the game will also be used in a class in spring 2025 uh, in the geography department. The geography of energy is being adapted to focus on uh, regional uh, decarbonization, using the game as one way of playing out different scenarios. So if you're interested in the game, um, you can take a look at the uh, the course listings in uh, later in the semester and sign up for Geography of Energy. Yes, can I use my phone? You can talk. Uh, you can talk. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Uh, any other questions on the game or? Uh, just a comment on wind turbines. Um, uh, a year and a half ago, we took our energy environment class to the uh, Ravenswood Power, Power Plant in Long Island City, which is a small class you can see from King Park Bridge. They have a plan for offshore wind, so you, can, you actually can't see them. Nice. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, some of the, if you can see on the, oh yeah, the board's folded, but there are, like, a lot of spots on our map are kind of, like, offshore uh, from Long Island, so that's, some of them might be within sight, but it's also going to be where they're at. Uh, yeah. Would this be available to a community group, a non-academic group? Uh, yes, there's a there's a link. Uh, I could probably show the QR code that um, it's it should be available for like general purchase in November. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, any anyone could buy it and use it for whatever. 
you know, the game has been kind of hand assembled uh, over the last few years, but this year um, we're moving into mass production of it. And so we'll have a lot more copies available for sale. So um, check with me and with Truly, and we'll pass on the link to that. And mm -hmm. um, hopefully send out an email in November saying they're available. Yeah, this is such a great idea and it's so engaging. I think it would be great if, if you know, the climate movement in general could really, and, and uh, you know, the POC environmental justice working group, could really push this as you know, a great activity at a party, um, you know, just a really fun way of engaging people and, um, and learning something. But thank you for developing it and also making it so it is mass produced because that's really the, the, the deeper education. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you. It is really fun to watch people play it. People get really into it and like start coming up with all kinds of strategies about the best ways to like build things. And it, it's really cool seeing people get it. And I'm like, oh, we have to make this work. And it's it's just like a lot of fun. Any any other questions? Yeah, I I think that this is a really good educational tool. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think this is a really cool. Okay. I think this is a really great educational tool, but um, I'm curious if this like becomes pretty successful. Are you have you guys thought about like making it a computer or mobile game too? Because that has a lot of outreach. Yeah, we've definitely considered. I think somebody at one point made like a there's like a tool you can use on Steam to make like virtual board games. I think someone inputted it into that once and kind of made like a mock up virtual version. But uh, yeah, it would definitely work very well as a virtual game because there's so much to keep track of. And if you have a computer keeping track of that for you, it makes it kind of even easier to like know where everything's at and you don't have to move pieces around. So I think that would be definitely a good idea for the future. Especially for making it like something that people can envision because it's very hard for people to envision like how we can change things, but this may be really helpful. Yeah, definitely. definitely. <laughs> Uh, all right, if no one has any more questions, um, well, first of all, if you do have questions later, feel free to come and ask me. I'm always happy to talk about energetics. Um, but for now, let's uh, move on to Lily, who's going to be giving us some observations about <laughs> Thank you to all the speakers that have gone so far. Amazing job. So as you guys know, my name is Lily. I'm a current Hunter student. I am a sophomore and I will be giving a little spiel on behalf of Nyberg. So for those who don't know what Nyberg is, it is the New York Public Interest Research Group. And we're basically a nonpartisan organization that goes around supporting policies that we feel like would benefit all New Yorkers. So Nyberg had me do a little bit of journalism today? Well, not today, well, uh, for today, they maybe do journalism for today. So if you saw me around Hunter campus taking pictures of the decrepitness of this institution, it was for today, it was for a good cause. So this is right by our office in Thomas Hunter, it's a cracked window, and I know this didn't get into the slide, but next to it was like a broken wheelchair shaft where people with different disabilities could have gone onto. So yeah, that's broken. This was in the North Building near one of the classrooms all the way in the end. I was afraid I would get radiation poisoning, but yeah, that's broken too. And this was also in the North Building where I was looking up after feeling something drip on my hijab and I'm just like, Godzilla? No, it was just the building. <laughs> but you know, this brings up a really important issue of climate change not being some hypothetical that's going to only impact us literally on the outside. It also talks about climate change on the inside. So, um, how many of you were here for fall 2023? No, everybody? Okay, yeah, I see a lot of people. So while I was doing night perk stuff in spring 2024, you know, talking about the public, the public budget survey and the MTA feedback survey, I had this event that I would get people to fill out the survey call by referencing the Great Flood. I'm not talking about like Noah's Ark. I'm not talking about the Epic of Gilgamesh. I'm talking about the fact that in the middle of a random day in fall semester, all the trains stopped working because of the rain. I remember I was stranded at Union Square after class has finished. And I like once class finished, the whole basement was flooded. I had to go to the sixth downtown from outside the building. And once I reached Union Square, all the trains to Brooklyn were just like 
gone, Zappo, not working. And yeah, I had to wait for my sister to call an Uber. It was a hundred bucks because, you know, Uber prices kept raising with everything, all the public transportation being down. I came home and my home is basically a basement apartment and my home was flooded and I had to rescue my cat like under the couch. So yeah. This was very traumatic, but I feel like it's something that all of us can relate to on some level, which is pretty, which is pretty bad in hindsight. But you know, all my colleagues here talked about scientific stuff and educational stuff, how things can actually get better. I'm going to come from a public policy lens on Local Law 97. Now, Local Law 97 is an effect. It is a law. It helps NYC's building emissions, which primarily come from large buildings, such as our college. It makes college administrators reduce emissions and improve energy efficiency, which creates tens of thousands of green jobs. It's lowering utility bills. It's improving air quality. It's growing industries like architecture and engineering, all majors at CUNY. Most of which are at City College, but wouldn't that be so cool if City College students came and fixed our building? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but CUNY students related fields could benefit from that. And it's you know crucial to ensuring the city remains livable for future generations. But there is a major threat to Local Law 97, which is Intro 772. It just exempts many large co-op and condo buildings because it weakens the formula for calculating indoor air pollution by allowing outdoor space. You know, it also eliminates penalties for certain buildings by, you know, wait, I lost my page. Okay, by allowing outdoor space to count as indoor square footage, enabling more pollution per square foot, eliminates penalties for certain buildings based on arbitrary property tax valuations, it also allows for double counting of those energy improvements made before 2019, despite those already being considered under local law 97. So yeah, intro 772, bad stuff. Now you're probably thinking, how can I do this? How can I stop intro 772? Contact your local council member, your local assembly person. Like here, I'm going to like do a little promotion, but NYPIRC has this thing called NYPIRC.RefBinder. And if you just put in your address and it gives you all your local representatives and your national representatives, and your federal representatives, it is like your constitutional right to complain. Like every day I wake up and I'm gonna be like, what can I complain about today? And you shouldn't even think about it as complaining because complaining is just a word that people in public sectors use to make you seem like your opinions are not that important. What can you advocate about today? So yeah, it's just very important that you as New Yorkers take these steps to make sure that Hunter College despite its falling infrastructure, despite the fact that the North Building is probably something out of the back rooms, <laughs> something that you can like, you know, take care of. You can put pressure. People love when they're in your face and you'd be like, what are you doing about it? But accountability is the only thing that ensures change is possible. Now, I think I have time for questions or thoughts and comments or concerns. I don't really know how this is like Yeah, hi. 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 Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Naomi. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Facilities Planning and Capital Projects. And what we're in for Hunter College. And what we're in the middle of doing right now is a better job at letting you know what we are doing here. Um, we're about to put $36 million into Thomas Hunter Hall, which very few people know about because we haven't done a good job at our website. And that will fix the infrastructure in there, in that it used to be Thomas Hunter High School, and it never had a real infrastructure. And it's going to be one of the most sustainable buildings in CUNY once it's done. We're going to introduce central HVAC and heating systems. Uh, it's going to be extremely energy efficient. It's going to be one of the best in the CUNY system. Uh, we're about to put $49 million into North Building to bring uh, some of the sciences over from Brookdale, where we'll be creating new HVAC systems into North Building. So we haven't done a very good job at letting everybody know, but you'll see updates on our website soon. And I came in a little late from a uh, West Building Energy Infrastructure Project Meeting, which is going to improve the systems in the West Building. So I can't disagree with a thing that you've said. Um, I've been here three years, and when I got here, I saw tremendous neglect of the infrastructure, which I picked to, these things don't happen overnight. We're dealing with 20, 
last year's neglect of investment in the infrastructure. And we now have about $400 million of capital lined up for main campus alone uh, to improve the system. So thank you. Um, and look at the website. I'm, I'm hoping within four to six weeks that you'll see some improvement in our conveying to you what we're doing here and to college. So uh, we're improving it. <laughs> but you want the, the processes for spending capital money, they're slow, but little by little, you will begin to see in November, a major project underway with the North Building. Thomas Hunter Hall will be in construction by the spring. So you're going to begin seeing uh, improvements soon. So watch the website and thank you for uh, reinforcing the fact you can make a difference. Thank you so much for <laughs> so if you don't mind me, may I ask a follow-up question regarding around renovations and how they're going to be more energy efficient? Mm -hmm. I understand there's like four hundred million dollars, yeah. I think. You said capital. I'm gonna use dollars as you know, money. Yeah. There's four hundred million dollars like of uh, for renovations, and you said they'd be like done around like Thomas Hunter would be were done around like spring, the other buildings would be done around next fall or next uh, fall, I think. Uh, the North Hall starts uh, in November. Okay. North Building starts November of this year. Thomas Central Hall in the spring of next year. And West Building with in the planning phase. And they are energy efficient um, in that we're going to, we will be moving away from uh, refrigerants currently in use to the, the new refrigerants. Uh, we'll be installing a new building management systems controls, which are all electric. Um, so we're going to upgrade the electrical service and try and move away from fossil fuels. And people have to remember that uh, natural gas is a fossil fuel. And we're going to start moving away from the boilers and the steam, because New York City generates a lot of that with a plant downtown, which I believe is coal fire. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's, yes. So we're we're mm. we're moving away from dependency upon um, mm. uh, ozone depleting refrigerants, uh, more towards electric controls, uh, and in full conformance with uh, the current regulations. You know, uh, we're we're out ahead, believe it or not. <laughs> and do you like? Do you predict that like everything will go according to plan? Because when I hear renovations, I'm thinking, oh, crowded hallways, maintenance, like if there are a bunch of students like in the one building because the other building is closed for these infrastructure improvements, are they actually going to you know happen, especially with class delays and stuff? Like, will we have to wait a short while for a big improvement or will this just be you know a long time so we can have some sense of normalcy with classes? Um, but we, we should hire you. <laughs> so these are the struggles. We're, we're in occupied buildings, um, but the projects are funded. And uh, North Hall just went out to bid. Um, and they're designed in a phased way to the best of our ability to accommodate the fact that we have massive infrastructure changes in occupied buildings, right? So we'll do our best. I'm sure the concerns will come our way and we'll address them if they arise. But they're designed uh, with a with a plan, with the full knowledge that we're in occupied buildings. Yeah. So put up with us for a little bit. Um, and and I have a colleague here, Kelly Stevens, who is working on smaller, you know, day to day, but no less important. Um, uh, programs like uh, shredding, <laughs> shredding paper and making sure those things are recycled. Mm -hmm. um, so we're at this on different levels to the infrastructure, small day-to-day -day issues. Yes, I yes. I wonder if you could explain what's displacing the steam, the coal-fired steam. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, in your glove box, yeah. yeah. Um, electric, we, we, we have to go back to uh, the grid, which isn't robust enough mm -hmm. yet. Um, so are you are you installing heat pumps? What what kind of technology are you using? Silverman already has a heat pump mm -hmm. in it. Um, not so much heat pumps here at main building. 
uh, that main campus uh, because we have um, refrigeration systems so we can improve and go to lower or zero ozone um, depleting refrigeration systems here. Not so much in house. We have yeah, two, I, I, two, over two and a half million square feet down here. It, it's difficult to install heat. So are you talking about electric baseboard heat? No, 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 no. no. I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm just trying to understand what, what this means. Um, it will still be big systems that are based on refrigerants. Um, and the controls within the buildings will be electric. And that's moving us away from fossil fuels. You mean a large heat pump system? It, it won't be so much a heat pump, no. It will be air, water cool, air distributed oh. refrigerants. Oh. But what about the heat? Uh, heat would be electric coils, heating all of that outside air that's coming in, tempering it. Um, so it'd be electric heat. Mm -hmm. It won't be an exchange of, of heat that you put in a loop. Yes, I see some questions from our ninth group students of Jacob and then Judy Aneta and then you, lovely person. Hi, Hi. Uh, Oh, good to see. I'm very loud. Um, hi, I'm Jacob. I'm part of the Nightbird with all these beautiful, lovely people. I'm the project leader for public health. Um, you talk about uh, a lot about sustainability. Is there any plan to fix any of the maintenance issues that are shown in the in the photos? I just want to bring this back to what Lily was bringing up. Yeah, um, it, it's little by little. Um, uh, our staffing levels um, are not perhaps what they should be for the nearly 3 million square feet that, that Hunter has. Uh, we have an incredibly dedicated and wonderful group of trades that work here. And sometimes we're more reactive than preventive just due to the volume of work. As I say, these things don't happen overnight. Those, those are pipes. I can see the chilled water lined up there and some insulation that's been cut out, mm -hmm. right? We, we, we have to be reactive much of the time, unfortunately. And then my follow-up question is, is there, is there any, like, on the priority list, how prioritized is fixing the maintenance issues specifically? Every day they're on, on the high priority list. Okay. And Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> every, every day, really. The, the bridges, um, they're on our capital project list. The roofs are failing. Um, the, the building, the exterior of the bridges is failing. That's why you're always seeing the, the buckets there and the rain coming in during the loops. Yes, I was here for that part of it, work and tracing out the problems and leaks. We're, we're band-aiding a lot until we can get the large capital money to do the real fixes. Mm -hmm. You have a very good point, but mm -hmm. we're, we're trying. Um, I believe Judy Aneto is next. Any questions first? Um, Expert? So I have a question for both of you, okay? And this seems like a very ambitious, uh, very ambitious changes that you want to do after, you know, the, as you said, 20 years in the book. Um, but one thing I, I think is very important is getting the students to be very energetic and ambitious for these. Um, and you mentioned before that there's, you know, sort of lack of communication here. How do you, uh, the two of you, uh, what are some ways that you think that it would be good for the college to get out and communicate these to the students, get them ambitious for this, to have to have them ha get good um, visions for this, um, so they feel like they can have a sort of sense of community here? Okay, so I can start off with that as a student. So, you know, it's great that we have websites for things, especially if you want to go more in detail, but no students that think to themselves when the sky bridge is leaking, hmm, I wonder if that Hunter Faculty Maintenance website had something on this. Usually it's social media, such as Instagram or TikTok that Hunter students communicate through. Like our organization has a WhatsApp we text all the time about what's happening around Hunter. So I feel like there's definitely a social media aspect to it, but there's also a human aspect, you know, us as NYPER students, we do a lot of tabling, we scream, we yell in the hallways, we make direct eye contact with people and be like, do you want to do this thing? Do you want to volunteer for these issues? Do you want to register to vote? Which people are doing outside if you guys are not registered to vote. Just, just plug that in. But yeah, um, 
it's definitely a social media aspect. It's also just a human aspect. So a lot of communication, which does require manpower. So I don't know if your department wants some night perch students that are really active in green campaigning, we can totally like lend a few. We're always eager for internship hours and just anything that's related to public policy <laughs> that makes them better. Yeah, we are hungry for internship hours. <laughs> yeah, we can help a lot. We are very proactive. Um, I would like to go back to you, but I think you want to add something. Well, we're, we're short staffed and so busy implementing these projects, and uh, you can tell I'm pretty nuts and bolts uh, about getting getting the work done, the much needed work done. Um, I think we're going. My generation starts with websites, right? That, that's where we go, and where it goes from there, I think, needs to just evolve. Um, but let's start with a website. I'm over 30 and I can really handle a website right now. But we'll, we'll start there um, and then see where that takes us. But we're very hard at work uh, implementing all of these um, needs. So one step at a time is all I can say because we, we are thin on the ground. Okay. Thank you so much for your expert input. I'm going to walk up this incline and give the microphone to Robert. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, this is wonderful. This is great. I just want to comment on, uh, I, I want to ask you a question about geothermal. I don't know if that's a possibility that would, that's usually a game changer if you can have it. But just to, to a little bit of, of, of context, the short staffing, all of CUNY is short staffed. I started teaching at Brooklyn College when NYPIRG started, mm -hmm. which was 1973. NYPIRG and the Professional Staff Congress are the union that represents the faculty and staff at CUNY. We have been partners throughout that, that was almost 50 years or 50 years. And um, we've been partners because we all believe in the public sector. We believe in building the public sector. A few years after NYPIRG started, that was when that neoliberal period began, where there was a complete degradation and, and a downgrading of the public sector for all of the services that we need to have a decent life. Mm -hmm. And CUNY has been one of the worst recipients of that bad policy. Contra College, a fabulous college, great students, great faculty, and we really did a wonderful campus struggling, as Brooklyn College has, CCNY, so many of the others, that have been degraded by a lack of funding. So I think we have to think about the climate. We have to think about changing our buildings. We have to think about increasing our staffing. And we have to think about pushing for greater funding for the public sector in general and for CUNY in particular. We're allies together on this. We can't let anyone separate the faculty, staff, and students from each other. And we, we really have to um, make this happen because we can't rely on uh, our um, uh, the policymakers to do this. We have to push them real hard. So uh, thank you for the announcement. Thank you for your valuable input. Yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of reiterate some of the things that have been said. Um, capital projects are critical to decarbonizing all of the community facilities. Because nothing happens without us making these big changes to convert from natural gas to electricity, other means of um, providing services to the buildings that are not uh, climate damaging. But what's really important that often gets neglected is the ongoing maintenance of all the systems. And if the, the, the 20 year period of neglect that we've seen, that's the maintenance that is deferred that ended up causing major damage to systems that made them less efficient that made them perform poorly. So that has to happen through staffing and ongoing funding. And so when we begin approaching uh, Albany with requests for what can be done, ongoing increased funding for maintenance and staffing at CUNY is something that's really critical. Capital projects are, are absolutely a, a must, but they have to be supported by this ongoing commitment to staffing at, at, at CUNY that allow us to keep these buildings performing at the level we expect. Thank you for that input. It's always valuable to know that we invest our money in something. We want it to last and we want it to do well. 
Are there any more questions, comments, or concerns before I turn it over to the next speaker? Yeah. Okay. Without further ado, I hope that you enjoy On Kids' presentation. And thank you to my bird, um, perfect, uh, uh, PSC, uh, and all the wonderful community who have been following and putting this together. My name is uh, Ankit Bardwaj. I use he and pronouns. I'm a member of the Public Power New York Coalition. Um, and I'm going to be very brief. Um, I think we might be behind time a little, but that's normal. But we have two principles uh, as part of our movement. Uh, the first is public ownership of renewable energy uh, to address the climate change crisis. And I think we've shared real deep support for public institutions. We really believe institutions like CUNY, uh, like other public authorities are essential for ordinary New Yorkers to address and live a healthy and, and climate safe life in the coming years. And the second is democracy, our voice in uh, putting pressure on both public institutions and other uh, market actors that uh, own and use our energy. So briefly, just going to lay out why we have sort of honed in on our particular approach to emphasizing public ownership of energy. Before I do that, uh, one thing we realized was that energy is governed at the state level. If we want to decarbonize Hunter College, if we want to decarbonize New York City, we need to have conversations of how to manage the grid, how to manage power plants that don't just rest within the city's borders or within Hunter College itself, but just right outside of it. So we stitched together an amazing coalition of environmental justice advocates around the state, um, members of uh, mass mobilization networks such as the Democratic Social of America around the state, and folks that have been fighting for energy democracy uh, as far away as Buffalo and Syracuse and also Long Island. So our idea was that we needed to think through how do we transform the system. And there are three components to the system. It's who makes the energy generation, who transmits the energy over long distances. Say you have a power plant sitting somewhere in the Hudson Valley, and you want the energy to come here and power this classroom, this beautiful classroom from your college. And then who distributes the energy within New York City itself. And the challenge is that over the last couple of decades, more and more private sector market actors have owned each of these different portions. Right? They've been chasing, they're building power plants to chase profits rather than reduce pollution or address community needs. One thing we found out early on in our research was that actually New York has one of the largest publicly owned energy utilities, the New York Power Authority. This is a green, oh, sorry, not a green New Deal, hopefully a green New Deal era institution, but a New Deal era institution that was empowered by Governor Roosevelt at the time to construct these large hydroelectric power dams that are actually the biggest chunk of renewable energy currently in New York State. So if you're not familiar, a lot of the energy that the state is powered with are these large hydroelectric dams near the Niagara Falls, near St. Lawrence River, um, that were built during uh, New Deal era the 60s, uh, and around the 60s that generate more than 60 to 70 percent of current levels of New York State's renewable energy. In 2023, we thought we can compel this state, we can mandate this agency to build not only hydroelectric power, but also renewable power. And along with organizations like PSC, unions, and ordinary New Yorkers, we fought a three-year legislative campaign and passed this amazing law uh, in 2023, the Build Public Renewables Act. Has anyone heard of the Build Public Renewables Act? This was, I thought, an amazing victory where it's, uh, some have touted as the largest Green New Deal bill in the country and had four specific pillars. The first is that it provides New York, the New York Power Authority a specific climate mandate. It authorizes it to build enough public renewables to meet the state's very ambitious climate goals, including 70% renewable energy by 2030. Would anyone hazard a guess of where we're at right now here in 2024? I think I heard it. 30%. 30% or so, that's right. So we have a long, long, long way to go, and Governor Hochul is a bit asleep on the wheel. We have other different pillars here. The first is that all projects will have to meet gold standard project labor agreements. Um, we'll have a training fund for uh, creating great union jobs. Um, it will accelerate the peaker shutdown. So there, these are really, really polluting gas plants that are especially around New York City uh, that turn on not, that, not for long and they're extremely polluting. They were mandated to shut down in 2032 or 2035, now we're going to be managed to shut down in 2030. And finally, one of the things we're most proud of is this program called REACH, which is the more renewables you build, the lower your energy bill rate. 
the more renewables there are, there's going to be more and more ability for those that rely on that power. The challenge is, is that one needs to not just pass the bill, but one needs to implement the bill. And over the past two years, we've seen that there's been a minimal of progress by Governor Boko on pursuing the state's renewable energy goals. We actually have less renewables in the state than we did in 2019 when the state's very ambitious climate act passed. So our current phase of the campaign is to put pressure on Governor Boko so as to use this amazing resource that we have, this amazing public institution, New York Power Authority, to build tremendous amount of renewable energy so that we meet this ambitious 2030 target. And part of that starts with empowering public institutions like CUNY, like SUNY, like public hospitals. Uh, NICA is mandated to create decarbonization plans for Hunter College and for other CUNY campuses. We think this is a great moment to build not only the millions of dollars that we currently have for capital projects, but maybe billions of dollars, uh, both for making our buildings and classrooms healthier, but also bringing public renewables such as rooftop solar, maybe even battery, maybe other kinds of ambitious and innovative geothermal and district heating projects. So it starts with building what we think is 15 gigawatts, which is going to be the amount of renewables we need to meet the 2030 target um, by 2030, and centering those on campuses that have faced years and years of disinvestment, like currently, like CUNY campuses currently, and making sure they get the funds and resources they need. And along with this comes with the creation of 25,000 green jobs to fund training and other support services for those workers that need retraining to get uh, ready for the green economy, to cut utility bills in half for those that need it the most, and to shut down as soon as possible the polluting PICA plant. So that's actually the phase of the campaign. And the reason we're making these demands right now is because NICA is set to release its strategic renewable energy development plan in the next coming weeks. I was actually just at White Plains protesting at their headquarters about an hour ago. Um, and we're really excited for the campaign and use all this energy that Nightbird and other organizations are bringing here to compel NIPA to build 15 gigawatts renewable energy. So this is the first thing I'd ask is you to scan this QR code to send this demand alongside the demand that we should build these facilities uh, and other kinds of public green and infrastructure in campuses like CUNY and SUNY, and make sure that the benefits of the coming renewable energy grid come to ordinary New Yorkers. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. I'll happy to take any questions, but also be involved in really creative discussions, both with organizations working on campus, to think about the ways in which NIPA can be the agency that brings those billions of dollars we need to make healthier buildings here. All right, thank you. Who controls NIFA? Like, who are like the yeah. who are like the targets? Who are the people? Like, yeah. that's a great organized question. So we've we've uh, you know through our research we really identified that Governor Hochul owns the keys. So this is an agency the governor has often used for their own projects. For example, uh, Governor Cuomo used NIFA to put uh, lights on the, the, what was called the Cuomo Bridge, which is now the Tappan Zee Bridge. So in the past, sort of the, this has been a vanity project agency. But we think it can be empowered for ordinary New Yorkers. So we, our current pressure is on Governor Hochul, but there are other actors within NIPA itself. NIPA leadership, like President Justin Driscoll, um, is an important actor here, and also the Board of Trustees. So these are appointed often from state legislature, often from uh, private market agencies and financiers to hold NIPA up to a certain standard. So we've been putting pressure both on the president and the Board of Trustees as well. Uh, who are ultimately responsible for signing off on this plan. But from our research, we understand that Governor Vogel is the one who holds the keys. Great question. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jessica Lee. I'm from Brooklyn. Um, I was just also wondering, a big um, news item lately was the congestion pricing and how that failed to happen. And I was wondering if there was anything your organization is doing to encourage that to come back, or if there's anything at this point that even can be done because it would solve so much. And yeah, how does that play into all this? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that congestion pricing is a great uh, indicator of the lack of faith in public institutions and public taxation of environmental pollution. And I think there are a lot of bills on the on the table right now emphasizing that that we uh, tax the polluters. But really, our goal here is also to emphasize on what we do with the money. 
Nightbot is extremely empowered. It has a double A plus bond rating. It actually increased by Moody's just last week. We think they're already ready to borrow millions of dollars to start building projects that will accelerate our renewable energy uh, future. So while there are some setbacks that we would love to fight alongside, these are all these positive projects that we might can enable at the moment. So, yeah. Thank you for all that. And I definitely don't want to distract from the targeting on the vocal and NIFA portion. But for those who are interested in also telling the governor about congestion pricing, mm -hmm. uh, look up the Riders Alliance and they have some good campaigns going, including the governor is the one who just said she was, you know, pausing it. So she has the power to restart it at any time. So we are trying to communicate to her to put that back in place. And um, we are uh, set to have Controller Lander here in mm -hmm. a few minutes. And I know that he is also involved and in, uh, touting some lawsuits that say, Opal didn't even have the authority to pause it because it's the law. So mm -hmm. um, someone may want to ask uh, Controller mm -hmm. Lander about that as well, about what he's doing and how he can help on that. Mm -hmm. I should let you know of all the projects that we're doing. Knife is already partnering with CUNY in the center. And I'm sorry I mix up my projects a little bit. Uh, campus schools, uh, we're already doing the full building uh, LED lighting replacement. I'm pretty sure that one's through NIFA Heat. And with DCAS, we, uh, with DCAS to CUNY Central, uh, they're all already partnering as well. We'll be uh, starting a program to completely replace the lighting in the north building and the west building are our priority buildings because that's where the main uh, uh, concentration of classrooms is. So NIFA and DCAS are already partnering with CUNY and Hunter has two projects. Absolutely, and that's what makes this particular forum so exciting is that we already have a working relationship and there's nothing stopping us from making that as ambitious as possible. Uh, that will happen through pressure from folks like Nyberg and PSC as well. Um, <laughs> do you want to introduce me? I don't know. I don't know. I'm happy to take questions. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. We're going to take a short time for discussion groups where we're going to turn to our neighbors. If you don't know your neighbors, maybe introduce yourself. We're going to take about 10 minutes of group discussion. And so in that group discussion, we can think about some of the questions we talked about today. Um, some prompts could be, what do you think Hunter should be doing to decarbonize and clean up its facilities? Um, and then also, what actions can you take that would make the most impact? You know, where do you feel that your leverage is in life? You know, is it at the national level or the state level or the local level? Is it a personal level? You know, where do you think um, you know you can make the biggest impact? Is it by talking to companies about their pollution or your, your university or your student and you pay tuition? So maybe we could just break off into uh, small groups and uh, we'll do about 10 minutes of discussion and then we'll come back together as a group and talk about what we talked about. Um, so maybe introduce yourself to your neighbors. Say hi. Hello. Maybe she did that. I didn't 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. See ya. That was great. Yeah. You guys have been talking about you guys. I think my record is really important, even though we're doing enough. Yeah, no, we're doing it. We're doing it. We're doing it. We're the corner of this thing is good. They're the ones that like have the actual wire and stuff connect, you know, on the power plant and you're how you tune your building here. So they don't they have their own they're on a lot of own generation, but they own distribution they own distribution, distribution they try to use it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right, so the final decision would be able to charge you for whatever you want energy and then produce it. But because it's in the law, it's in like sending you this publicly on people that are going. Your bill will actually go down. The con ad is mandated to include that bill decrease in their bill. So that's one thing. Like the main thing we heard is like con ad bill, right? And they're not reliable. So we wanted to find a loophole in a way that like, we can't own the grid yet. But you know, is there a way to get a bill credit in there? And that's how we wrote that. Yeah. I don't know. It's very construction heavy outside. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Outside. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
for a, a contract that, that um, determines our wages and working conditions. And we do a lot of um, bargaining in, in the public interest, and we bargain a lot for student services and you know that kind of thing and push back against tuition. But um, one of the demands that we're making this round of negotiations is that uh, manage, CUNY management has to report on a regular basis their plans and their progress toward reaching those plans to decarbonize uh, the building and that that be a mandated part of the, uh, the labor management meetings. And uh, while it doesn't require them to do much more than report at this point, partly because it's not within the scope of bargaining to force them to do the actual work, but the transparency and the ability for us to make all of that public is really important. And um, you know, it, we're really glad that our, our union um, members and leadership have put that in as one of the bargaining demands so that we can stay on top of it. Because the easiest thing for management to do is to say, oh, we're taking care of it. Yes, it's a big problem, but we're, we're working on it. Well, good. What are you working on? When are you working on it? How much progress have you made? And I think a lot of unions, particularly public service unions, need to do something similar to that so that you know we have we have more control, and and um, that's important. So uh, thanks for raising this. Thank you. Uh, other groups, anybody from another group want to share something from their group discussions? Yeah, please. Uh, um, one of the things that we were talking about is there's a number of other collaborative organizations that are working on the decolonization, including like the Renewable Thermal Network, a regional thermal network, and the DCAR Summit that brings together like a lot of great professionals um, and, and, and companies with technologies that are really given a lot of thought to um, how this process would work. And, and I, I was just mentioning to our group, we went to one recently this past Friday, uh, where both um, uh, Bard College and Fordham University are really talking about their geothermal plan. So, and the projects they have underway. So, I thought that that would have a lot of applicability to what you're trying to accomplish here. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Over to Hi. I um. So this was kind of alluded to earlier, but our group um. You kind of went in a different direction with a question as far as what Hunter or Cuny need to do to clean up its facilities. And the answer we came up with actually to pivot more towards putting the money towards staff. Um, and I don't know, DMA and um, with the RDHS director might agree with us on that. Um, a lot of times when it comes to the cleanup of facilities, it really looks about to how efficient. So, probably more staffing um, do the preventative maintenance. Um, if you want to have an efficient system, you need to do more inspections, you need to do more monitoring. So um, that was kind of our answer. That's what we kind of discussed more at length in the group is that uh, should we need to actually put money towards actual hiring more staff. Uh, anyone else from the group discussion breakout groups we just had want to chime in with uh, something that group talked about? Otherwise, I think we're ready to move on to our next section. So uh, I'm very excited uh, to have uh, Brad Lander here. We're gonna have uh, Tom come up and introduce him. So uh, Tom and Gotti, would you like to come on up and we can uh, talk some remarks? Thank you. Uh, Tom and Gotti, I retired seven <laughs> years ago wow. from this noble institution and have been having a hell of a time <laughs> and uh, staying active. Uh, Brad Lander, I met when he was a master's student at Pratt Institute, where I taught for six years and I directed the planning program there before I was lassoed to come in here and work at Hunter. And I, I, I was a, an emer I'm an emeritus professor of urban policy and planning in the uh, in in uh, at Hunter, and I started the Hunter Center for Community Planning and Development, which had a good run for 15 years, 
worked with a lot of communities uh, across the city on planning and environmental justice issues. So let me tell you about my encounters with Brad. He was a master's student at, uh, at, in uh, the planning program, the graduate planning program at Brad Institute. Uh, a thesis is a requirement in order to graduate. So uh, Brad turned in a thesis that I that left me speechless because it was so professional in comparison to the average performance that I put it aside. Uh, he passed, and I worked very hard on the rest of the thesis that had to be read and uh, yeah. critiqued in detail. Um, Brad then went on. Uh, to work in the nonprofit world of Fifth Avenue Committee in Brooklyn, uh, the Pratt Center for Community and Environmental Development, uh, which was uh, uh, located in Pratt. Um, and uh, then when I moved here, I was recruited away from uh, Pratt Institute uh, to the Department of Urban Policy and Planning. And I started a um, a, uh, a center to work with neighborhoods and communities. Uh, nothing like Pratt, Pratt Center, which is one of the pioneering institutions around the country, uh, but uh, we worked with many community organizations and environmental justice groups across the city. Um, uh, I organized a panel here at, at Hunter of uh, policymakers, activists, and Brad partook in that. It was on housing, I believe. And uh, uh, he, uh, he graced the presence. It was a very informal event, but had a fairly good turnout. And, uh, and then he became my council representative. I live in Brooklyn, and he, uh, he was my rep. Uh, and one of the leaders of the Progressive Caucus in the council and uh, has pioneered, I think, in many initiatives. I still look at the bike lane along Prospect Park West and thank him for uh, advocating for uh, bicycle and pedestrian safety uh, throughout his district. Um, he's a, a champion of affordable housing I don't always agree with the details of the affordable housing uh, legislation that we have gotten in New York City, um, but it's a first step. It was a first step, and Brad was uh, very important in the creation of that um, during the uh, de Blasio administration. Uh, Brad's also been active in the participatory budgeting movement. I think that's one of the the first meetings uh, uh, we participated in was a coalition. It's, it's a, a way of, and it's really prophetic because he is now the city controller and deals with budgets uh, in a very central way. Uh, but uh, the commitment to engaging uh, citizens, engaging people throughout the city in the budgeting process I think is one of his very important um, advances. Um, and Brad's a CUNY supporter, and uh, uh, he, oh, and another uh, important move that he's taken recently is to support uh, the PSC's campaign against Medicare disadvantage, the Medicare Advantage uh, plan that was. Uh, um, uh, it was uh, passed that would have taken away many of the benefits uh, of our healthcare uh, programs. Uh, and, and Brad supports union efforts, unionized labor. Um, and, um, and I'd say finally, another one of his great contributions has been to take a careful look at our pension systems and look at how the money is being invested uh, and, uh, and understand 
what social merits or demerits um, are being attributed to those investments. So I'm really proud to invite Brad to come and share with us. Thank you so much, Tom. That is really nice. I don't know how many of you uh, have had the good fortune to get to know Tom Mangotti when he was a professor here. I guess if he's been retired for a little while, maybe not uh, not quite as many, but Tom is really one of the giants in New York City's uh, participatory grassroots and radical planning, community planning field. Um, I was indeed lucky to have him as a, a teacher and a thesis advisor. And as he said, you know, there are many areas where we have really agreed and been side by side. Um, and there's areas where he has pushed me and been part of organizing to push me harder and further to hold to that set of principles, um, which I've really valued and respected. And I know there's folks here today who uh, I think are excited about a bunch of the things we're working on and are pushing uh, us to go further in the controller's office. Exactly as Tom, what you're, you're doing. Professor so Benjamin how about Benjamin? let me first say a few things and then we push afterwards. You mentioned it as well. Right now, the pension funds that you control, they're investing in major liquid natified gas facilities. So how about you, you can not present have to folks what's going on? And then I'll be delighted to talk about this. So we actually have a Q&A coming up. Um, we want to make sure we hold our elected official accountable. You are the controller. You're right. So how about let me speak first, and then we'll be delighted to have a Q&A about it. So what? So why are you promising to you let me talk first in response to the decarbonized You need to hold on. You're going to disrespect our town hall. You're going to disrespect our town hall rather than the time. We want to fight the climate crisis here. Yeah, with respect, I want to be honored the decarbonized CUNY town hall I was invited to, and I'll be real happy to answer your question after I've had a chance to speak. We're going to take a few minutes here, and that's about it. We just want to answer. Why is not your town hall? Why are you funding PE that does Why are you disrespecting the decarbonized CUNY town hall? We'll be here. We're going to ask you to leave. For us, the status quo, the quorum, the number. I'll be glad to answer your question after I give you a few minutes. I would ask you to please respect the other people who are here to listen to what Brad Lander has to say. We have valid questions and yeah, we want to absolutely. hear what he has to say. So but let's have him answer. Don't monopolize this event. Then two minutes and on. On. No, you can ask for two minutes. And then we'll ask again in the Q&A. But he's not going to ask for that. Yeah, we're just like Right, it's not the organizers are asking for respect the format or you can refuse to take the respect there. You're refusing to be moving out of fossil fuels. I'd be really glad to answer your question against my presentation first. But if you're going to disrespect the organizers, Take a minute. Respond at this moment. Right now, in a session, you will demand that the, your questions be answered. Yeah. Please. Oh, is that please right? let. Please let the, the proceedings continue. That, that's and, fine. He yeah. Can, but what, let's note here: he can answer in sixty seconds. He's not going to. Later, he's going to be misleading. We'll be right here. Watch. Thank you. Okay. So uh, it's a good model, organizing and pushing. All right, uh, it's great to be here. First of all, I'm thrilled that the decarbonized CUNY town halls are happening. Last week I was at uh, John Jay. I know they're happening all over the city. Thank you to PSC CUNY for your great organizing and to Public Power New York. Um, it's exciting to see young people remembering that we need to be fighting uh, the climate crisis with all the assets and resources that we have. Part of what I like about the way decarbonized CUNY is approaching things is you're thinking, okay, what's the footprint of our emissions and our fossil fuel harm? What are the resources and tools that we have to do something about it? And as Tom said, how do we think about deepening democracy while we do that for future organizing fights? That thesis he mentioned was actually on uh, democratic ownership of housing, which we were organizing on in Brooklyn. And here we are still fighting for that something more like the old Mitchell Lama program. And it's also why I like that Tom came to CUNY from Pratt, a great private institution, but public institutions like CUNY are just irreplaceable. Um, and what you guys are doing here really matters enormously. We try to take the same approach to confronting the climate crisis in the controller's office. What are the biggest areas of our emissions and our harm? What are our critical tools? And how do we deepen democracy as we move forward in this fight? For the city as a whole, uh, the biggest source of emissions are our buildings in many ways. Like CUNY, 70% of the city's emissions uh, come from their buildings. That's why Local Law 97 passed uh, through the advocacy of some of the folks in the room. 
is such a critical approach for the city as a whole. And that's a big part of what CUNY can do. You've got your food systems and your waste systems and your curriculum and your leadership and your activism, but probably your buildings are the biggest source of your emissions and the biggest opportunity for decarbonization. For the controller's office, the biggest source of our emissions is in fact our pension funds. Uh, even though we got it, we're in the municipal building, the $275 billion that we manage which is the retirement savings of your professors uh, and of uh, public school teachers and firefighters and public hospital nurses and crossing guards. We save money to make sure they've got a good retirement future. And that's the $275 billion that is our responsibility working with the union and city trustees to invest. And I'm pleased to say that New York City is the only major US public pension fund that has divested its public equities investments from fossil fuel reserve owners, the only US public pension fund that has invested its private equities from what are called upstream fossil fuels extraction. Um, this past year, we led, uh, after some good engagement with activists, an effort to push banks uh, in whom both we invest and others invest to start being much more transparent about their fossil fuel lending uh, since the Paris Accords the major US and Canadian banks have lent over a trillion dollars on new fossil fuel extraction projects. So we led the effort to get them to have to disclose the ratio between their lending on fossil fuel extraction and their lending on clean energy. We're doing the same with utilities. We're scaling up about 11 billion of that 275 billion is directly invested in renewables and in climate solutions. And we just are joining a great global thing called the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance so we can team up with big European pension funds and others who are pushing because there's no way to get that $275 billion, which is invested all across the global economy cleaner if we don't push the global economy itself to be cleaner. You can't just sort of pick and choose and say, I only want the clean stuff. What you've got to do is say, I'm going to pull my money out of extraction and fossil fuels but I'm also gonna make sure that our banks and our utilities and our car companies and our construction companies and everything else that we invest in gets cleaner as well. Uh, some folks here want us to go further as they should and are pushing us to look at, I mentioned that we have an exclusion on what's called upstream fossil fuels, that's extraction, uh, who want us to exclude pipelines and natural gas terminals, midstream and downstream fossil fuels, a great push. We were the first public pension fund, still the only big one in the US to do upstream. Uh, and we're looking at midstream and downstream, would love to get there if we can. Um, so that's the pension funds. Um, I do wanna say one more thing we're doing in the office that really gets to this deepening democracy idea because it's well aligned with what Decarbonized CUNY is doing and Public Power in New York. Um, last year, a bunch of great activists passed in Albany an effort to say, let's make sure as we're generating power, more of it is publicly generated rather than by privately held companies or utilities. And we're working on that at the city through a program we have called Public Solar NYC. We got a grant from the Inflation Reduction Act from the federal government. If you're a small homeowner in New York City, it's pretty expensive to do solar on your roof. Um, and very, very few people are doing it. You have to come up with money out of your pocket. It's almost like you have to be a developer even to navigate the federal tax credits and grants. So we're developing a program where the city itself will come to homeowners and say, hey, we'll put the solar infrastructure on your roof. We'll pay out of the city's and the federal government's pocket. You don't have to come up with any money. You don't have to act like a developer. And over time, we'll build out what is public infrastructure on the rooftops of New York City sharing the energy benefits with those building owners. And that's something we'd love to think about how we could partner with CUNY on as we get that going, just as we're doing it on one to four family homes. Hopefully we can be doing it on CUNY campuses and all across the city and build the renewable energy that we need um, in a way that's democratically controlled. So those are the things we're doing. I think they go really well with what Decarbonize CUNY is doing. Um, I talked a little about midstream and downstream fossil fuels. Um, and if you guys want to ask why you know, we have not yet found cleaner managers, you're going to know the best. Yeah, so the, the question is, you just said that you'd like to get there. You're the decision maker. Why don't you just say that you're going to institute a policy yeah. to end new investments in LNG, the worst polluting stuff on the planet? 
So as you know, because you helped lead the advocacy that moved the prior controller and kind of our funds to divest from fossil fuel reserve owners, I'm not in fact the sole decision maker. There's 75 trustees plus five funds. We do a lot of study, we prepare a lot of research. We just got through making the decision on excluding upstream fossil fuels after a good deal of advocacy. Um, you know, we got a lot else we're doing in the in the climate space, and we go step by step. So, so right, this is fun. We're considering. So we'll take a few minutes, right? We'll get back on topic in a moment. But on upstream fossil fuels, you didn't really have any investments in it, so it's giving us ice and winter on midstream. And right, on midstream is saying in the future, just a moment, just you a moment, won't do any investments in that. It took a long decision making process for us to do it. It did. To get all five. But on midstream, you could, we asked you to do all fossil fuels and have them for years, now, right? And so on midstream, you're the controller, you're the key person in the pension funds. Yes, you need other trustees, but you supervise the staff, you lead this process. Why don't you just announce that as your position? Take that position. Oh, and PS, we've talked to the other trustees. They say they will do it if you do it. That's why not my experience of our other trustees, I will tell you. If you could tell me which ones are already supporting it, I'd be glad to know. In my experience, each staff look. Uh, when we started doing the divestment in public equities, one of the funds had moved, but the biggest fund, even though they had voted when I came in, said, actually, we're not ready to do it. And I had to go back with them and like do a whole second round of studies and help them three be persuaded to divest. Three out of four was done They announced it three out of out three, out of three but the third was the biggest one. And it, it had, to, had to go back and do the work. The answer is actually the work. didn't change policy because that was a huge win. We appreciate you finish out public market divestment. Not asking for your appreciation this report, not what City, I'm, I'm just speaking the facts. New York City needs to lead the world. New York and City is about money managers real quick. So by far the, the large, the yeah. most aggressive US public so, social fund on decarbonization and we're proud to be it. Right, but that's not because of you. That's because of what we want you all can say it how you want, but yeah. uh, we feel really proud so of what you, we've done at the banks, what we've done at the utilities, what yeah. we've done on credit the upstream. This no US public pension. Well, you still really have people in the Gulf South are suffering. There are massive public appeal projects that are being built. Because of your supervision, you are the direct decision maker here, Brad Langworth. We need you to step up. We don't need talk. We need climate action. We need it now. This starts with you taking full responsibility. Clean up your money managers and ensure that private equity isn't investing. So, you know, on cleaner money managers, every time you come and protest, I invite you to give me a list of who you think cleaner managers are. So far, you haven't given us a list with a single it's, name. It's on, on. it's on the fact sheet. You know that. So you're There's not one to... name of a cleaner manager on your fact sheet unless you've uh, adjusted your fact sheet. So look, you can look at the hyperlinks, but manager. you have a whole staff that understands how to differentiate. And you name one of the cleaner managers, managers that you're asking us to move our so money to. There's Amundi, there's Ostrom, there's BNP. You are uh, the that. European managers are huge uh, and cleaner, not clean, but cleaner. So if you start to shift money from BlackRock, where you have $60 billion, and they're the dirtiest manager in the world, the biggest single force. They're, they're the largest for sure because they're moving, the largest in everything, but that's not a the metric or right. a so ratio. start moving money from no, that to the cleaner managers. That's what the red states are doing, except the opposite direction. This isn't going to work. You talk about decarbonizing the portfolio. It won't decarbonize unless you get the money managers to move. It probably it won't work. It won't work. Thank you very much. And thank you, you for this time. You, you, yeah. You, uh, we've heard your questions. Yeah. And who controls this? So thank you very much. If we can move on to uh, the rest of the presentation and any questions that other folks may have. Yeah, no, thank you. I think it's a pre finished presenting, and if there's yeah. other folks that have questions, we'll 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 yes, please. Open we'll forum, and yeah. we want to, you know, we want to know who you guys are or like what is oh, you're we're fighting we're, for. Because you guys are talking a little yeah. bit in like a lot of technical language that maybe the rest of us yeah. are not. We're, we're with, I'm with New York Communities for Change, and okay. Matt is with 350 MLC. Yeah. Okay, and what are you guys fighting for? We want the pension funds to actually step up to the fight of climate change. So the previous administration did a bunch of enormous things, and he's continued those things, and that's appreciated. However, the city funds need to take big, big, big leaps still. And that hasn't happened, and we're now almost three years in. Right now, Brad is going with BlackRock, and that's just simply unacceptable. We yeah. can move off the fuels. We just can't make these happen, I think. And what I would say to the CUNY students in the room is just like buildings are a sort of an, uh, uh, a source of emissions and an asset, just like pension funds are, activism is too. So I hope you'll take the model like what, what you guys have is a voice. 
is that it's worth organizing. It's worth, it's worth holding elected officials accountable. I don't always agree with the tactics, but just like I, you know, with my friend Tom, uh, it's good to push. So I hope in addition to thinking, how can we make our buildings cleaner? How can we reduce our waste? You're thinking, what are our opportunities to do organizing, to do research, to push public officials and to make change? So hopefully this was a useful uh, uh, harmonized cleaning town hall. As always, I want to give you a big shout out to my friend Nancy Romer, from whom I have learned a lot. So thank you very much. I really appreciate all you guys actively listening. And we'll see you out there. Thank you. Walk your talk, Brad. Walk and talk. Really. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Brad Lander, for coming in and giving that. Uh, and Tom. Thanks for the spirit of discussion. I actually like this kind of discussion where we talk through issues and think about what we should do. Next up, we have Nancy Romer. Uh, from Casey Cooney's Environmental Justice Working Group, who is a tireless advocate and does so much for organizing. And I just want to build up Nancy as being so fantastic. So, Nancy, I'm happy to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Andy. This is, uh, I, and I appreciate the whole dynamic that happened. It was exciting, right? <laughs> and, um, and I think uh, our, our advocates were um, powerful and our control was powerful. And, um, and it's a long process. I will say I was part of the divestment movement. I hadn't planned to say this, but I was part of the di divestment movement when Stringer was the controller, and um, and we you know, we bird dogged him like crazy. We drove him crazy, um, and and he started the process. But I remember sitting in on a, a trustees meeting of the um, the DC thirty seven fund, and um, you know this is before Brad's time. This is when Stringer was the um, Control it, and the 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 trustees did not want to change. It was a lot of pressure to get them to change at all. Even and and they were looking at scenarios. You know, the fund managers were looking at scenarios. Well, what if we have four degrees of increased temperature? What if we have five degrees? And you know, meanwhile, the planet would be burning. And um, so I I think it's really important to know that there are a lot we need to push. But there are a lot of factors that slow the process down and that are a, a, a lot of it is by law. We can't just move on a dime and say, yes, we have to do this. I would love to see the full decarbonization of the pension funds. That would be a wonderful thing. And I think we should keep pressing Brad because he, he agrees with us in a lot of ways and wants to see that happen. So yes to advocacy and yes to really good public officials who make it happen. It, it should happen sooner than later. Thank so, and also a big thank you to all of the organizers of this event. It, it's really, um, it's been great to see activism develop on our campuses around environmental issues. So now it is my uh, honor to meet for the first time Alex Morris, who is the New York State Assembly member of this district and the district around um, uh, around Hunter, he was an early supporter of the Build Public Renewables Act, which we very much appreciated. Um, he's an alumnus of the uh, Hunter uh, High School, Hunter College High School, that our friend um, Ross Pinkerton is a, a teacher at, and um, he's um, he's been a, a new and an active environmentalist and a an assembly member. It really matters who's in the state legislature. They determine a huge number of things, including our environmental future. And they can create the, the um, laws that then force our government to implement. Well, if the law is one thing. Implementation is another. With Build Public Renewables now, we are in the implementation stage. And I know that Assemblymember Forrest will help us do that. So here he is. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, yeah, I, I want to talk a lot about the Build Public Renewables Act and, and other environmental things that we're doing. Um, just to, you can leave the oh, <laughs> um, oh wow. Yeah, District 73 includes Hunter College. Um, uh, I, on top of that, I will also say thank you to, to DSE CUNY for inviting me. I'm also a, a strong union supporter and uh, son of two union members uh, who 
I, I say this often for those that were here uh, for the campaign or heard me that it's no knock on Hunter High School or any of the other schools I went to, but the best education I ever got was on the picket line with my dad. And so uh, unions uh, fighting for working people has been core to, to how I've come up and done this. Beyond the high school, I also actually took a few classes after I graduated college at Hunter College to build up some of my math background before I went to grad school. So uh, this institution has been helpful uh, for basically all of my development. I'm really honored to be here with all of you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the bill called the Renewables Act, and I'm going to talk about where I think we need to go from here, both from a state legislation uh, perspective, but also broadly from a policy perspective at all the levels of government. And Build Public Renewables uh, was not, not my bill. Uh, uh, it was there before I was, but I became a, a strong co-sponsor of it because we desperately need more renewable energy. There, we have a big push to electrify our buildings, to electrify um, a lot of what previously was burning fossil fuels. But in order to do that, we actually need to supply a lot of new energy. And uh, NIPA, the New York Power Authority, which provides a lot of power to uh, public institutions and to government institutions, was already producing a lot of renewable energy. About 70% of its portfolio was renewable. But they were, in fact, banned from building any new ones. The other 30% was all natural gas. And we decided, hey, we desperately need more energy. We'd love if it were actually owned by a public entity uh, that had its interests aligned with what we need as a state. And so let's not only empower it to build more renewable energy, but actually set a goal and a target of 100% renewable and what it continues to grow and build into that bill strong labor protections and strong protections for how it will build in order to do that. So that was passed as part of the budget uh, in this past year. As Nancy referenced, we are in the implementation phase and sometimes implementation doesn't always match uh, your, your high goals. And so we are staying very much on that and making sure that they accelerate these projects. And I think that's where we go from here is that Build Public Renewables is just one piece of a massive amount of clean energy that we need to get on the grid in the state as a whole and in particular in New York City. So who, who here has heard of the Peaker plants? That is the highest percentage I've ever gotten in a room going to say that. But this is, I guess I should expect that in this room. So yeah, nine peaker plants that are the dirtiest in the system that build uh, in New York City that burn natural gas and some burn oil. And the stated goal, I think still the official position is that we are closing them down next year, except uh, the authority that kind of looks at our load, our demand on the electric grid, New York ISO, uh, has said that if we were to shut down the peaker plants, anytime it got to 95 degrees in New York City, we would have nine hours of brownouts. So I think unless we drastically change the amount of renewable energy that's installed in our grid and able to do that, what that's effectively saying is we are not shutting them down next year, even if that is still the official policy that we are. We have not built the renewable energy and the grid updates that are required uh, because there's no way New York City residents are going to accept nine hour brownouts anytime it gets over 95 degrees. And so more and more, we need to be thinking about how we can be funding more of these projects directly, how we can reduce the burden and the permitting time and the length to get renewable energy, to expand the grid. And we have a lot of great opportunities to do that. Obviously, um, I think you all have already discussed the IRA and, and the Comptroller mentioned this as well, the Inflation Reduction Act has put an enormous amount of money out for projects that are shovel ready that can get going. We need to be using those more and more and more. Another thing we did in the state legislature this year, uh, which we're still waiting on the governor's signature for, was uh, the, the Superfund Act. Uh, see a lot of nodding heads on that, I guess. Yeah, in this room, this is cool that people uh, have this background. But for those that uh, haven't heard, the Superfund Act basically looks at past polluters uh, and it looks at the amount of pollution that you produce and puts an assessment, puts a fee on those polluters in proportion for the amount that they have done. Uh, and it's very cleverly designed because it only applies to the emissions that have happened in the past, which means if you just put a tax on carbon, which is a separate good idea, but uh, if you just put a tax on carbon, that would raise prices for everyone. If you do it as an assessment in the past, that means the biggest polluters are paying more, but they can't just raise their prices for the consumers because you could just buy from other people that weren't as bad in the past. 
And so it becomes a way to make sure a huge percentage of that fee is actually borne by the polluters themselves. Uh, and that will raise $3 billion a year that New York can now use on resiliency projects or renewable energy or other things that we desperately need in that transition. Um, and the last one I'd mentioned, which, which all of you uh, had a role in if you were New York voters, was passing the Environmental Bond Act last year, which created $4 billion that we can now use on these um, renewable projects and resiliency projects and other things like that as well. But if there's one message to leave you with, it is we are in a time right now where, and I think different than perhaps where we were as an environmental movement 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we're in a time where we need to build. We need to figure out how we can build renewable energy, how we can rebuild the grid, how we can actually get more capacity on there to meet all of our goals while we are electrifying, while we're doing everything else. We need to be able to build. And so we're always trying, going to be looking for ways in the state to fund that and to make that easier. Um, and with that, I think I will pause and, and happy to take any questions that people have. Thank you, Matt. Um, I have actually a question for you, but it's a question for Mr. Landers. Oh, he goes. Hey, hey, Brad, sorry. So you mentioned before, I mean, they, they were talking, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask a question, but we, you know, it sounds like you know that BlackRock and KPR are, are they're not the best financial uh, investors to put the money, the pension money away. And you asked the people who were talking, you said to give you a list. But I'm wondering, I'm assuming that you definitely know who better managers are. And if you do, that sounds like it's more your job than theirs to note to identify those uh, managers and then put the money where. So I'm wondering why, one, why you, maybe you have it, or if you have, share it with us. And then two, why you haven't used them instead of the managers like BlackRock and Hagar that we know are not optimal for funding. Yeah, so um, we, uh, you know, if, for folks that really want the details, on the Comptroller's website is our net zero implementation plan. We set a goal of being net zero by 2040. It's got a whole bunch of steps, and it includes evaluating all of the asset managers that we use. There's about 300 of them. And we set a whole bunch of standards for all of them. We ask those in what are called our public markets to answer all our questions by this June and our private markets by next June. Um, uh, I won't go into kind of what the targets are. And I guess what I'll say is it's not at all clear. BlackRock and KKR are the biggest and they're in the news. So it's easy to kind of throw darts at them. I'm not saying they're great. Yeah. All 300 of those managers, unfortunately, are invested in fossil fuels or, you know, BlackRock used to have our money in fossil fuels, but we divested it. It's like yeah. we moved our money out of it. Mm -hmm. It is not clear which of those 300 are cleaner or less clean. That's the process that we're currently engaged in. We're further along in it than any other US large public pension fund. We asked them to sit down and say, like, let's compare notes. We'll show you the questions we're asking. We'd be glad as to the extent that we could to share the metric and the framework that we're using. We want in the coming years to get all our investments under decarbonization plans with net zero goals and regular reporting and science-based targets. That includes, as I mentioned, the banks, the utilities, and the asset managers. And we are doing that, but right now I genuinely don't have kind of objective data that says BlackRock and KKR are any worse than Blackstone or Apollo or State Street or the other large managers. And we're in a process to try to get that data. So I appreciate the answer. It sounds like, uh, you know, I appreciate the candor. But well, we are really working on it. And I don't want to down the line and push it. You know, and that's I'm saying it sounds like there's an opportunity if someone could provide you with that data or to get that data that shows that. And we're working on it. And you can look at kind of what questions we're asking them. We'll be glad to share it with you. We've invited them to say, look, sit down with us. We'll look at the frameworks together. Like we really okay. do want to go more ambitious so here. Are you willing to extend the invitation again, like to come and like learn about it, what you're talking about? Is that, I mean, yeah, two thing? weeks ago, this was very polite compared to how they were two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, they like stormed the stage I was speaking on. And my response was to send a letter reiterating my invitation for okay. that. So, okay, yeah. so I appreciate so, it. I don't want to take anyone's no, time. No, of course, just have, good question. Um, Thank you. I just, I'll look on your website and check it out. Um, but yeah, but just my second question was for Alex was, you mentioned the peaker plants yeah. about the plant, you know, that we take yep. them offline, that there'll be brownouts, but what's, do you have a specific plan of what to do, like where to get 
our renewable energy from uh, to replace when if we take those plants. Off. Yeah, so, so to be clear, I, I don't control whether those plants get shut down or not. So, so I want to, you know. If you fantasize um, about a plan, like, if, I, we, if, what was if it? you fantasize about, if I fantasize about a plan, of, of we've gone from shutdown. fantasizing about a plan to concepts of a plan. There's, There's a lot of that. Uh, what would your plan conceptual be? Conceptual agreement for any followers in the New York State budget process. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, I think we need a lot more renewable energy. So one of the things that we are, uh, there, there's things that are theoretically easy, right? So let's knock those off to start, right? More solar on roofs is good, right? And the grid largely can handle the amount that we're going to do. Once you got to a certain point, you would need additional grid updates, but like, that's good. I actually got my start in politics, uh, door-to-door -door advocacy with the Working Families Party for the Green Jobs, Green New York Bond Act in 2009, which was similar to what the comptroller was describing of, uh, we'll issue bonds to pay for retrogrades to make your home more efficient, and then you can pay back the cost via just your savings on your energy bill, and so it costs you nothing and makes it safer in your right. There's all those sorts of things that we should be doing, right? More solar, more retrofitting of buildings, all of that. Um, once you get past the easy stuff, right, you get into actually hard decisions where things that are even like green from a carbon perspective, there are other trade-offs you would think about. Um, so there is a, I'm forgetting the word because it's not pipeline because it's an electrical line, but it, I guess power line. Transition. Thank you. Um, uh, transmission line from Canada to bring power down to New York City. Right. Um, that would work for like, I think, nine months out of the year. And then actually, when we need it most, they turn it off because they need it there. Um, but that energy is coming from places that people don't always love. The New York uh, Power Authority, 70% renewable. That's because it's hydropower. And hydropower, while well, green and clean, you dam certain rivers, that's not always great for the environment in different ways. Um, you have nuclear power, right? Uh, which for me, I think we're in a place where it is absolutely necessary. I wish it wasn't, but we're in a place where I think nuclear, at least maintaining what we have, has to be part of the solution going forward. But obviously there's different thoughts on that. Um, there's easy things for us to do, obviously, but then we are gonna have to face hard things. And if we don't face those hard things, uh, what we're going to do is keep the peaker plants on, even though we have stated goals of turning them off, right? And when we when we turned off Indian Point, uh, which when I was younger, I had protested Indian Point. Uh, when we turned off Indian Point, that was 25% of New York City's power. The, the dirtiness of our power went up. We had more from fossil fuels afterwards than we did before. Um, so there are going to have to be hard trade-offs there. Yeah. If I can try to pull the discussion back to Hunter College, great things that we can do here that interface with some of the things that Comptroller Lander had mentioned and that you're talking about. Um, what are the possibilities? How can Hunter fit into plans for deploying solar in the city and yeah. deploying storage, which is one means of eliminating Absolutely. the need for the peaker plants? Uh, it I know the um, financing solar power on our own doesn't pencil out because yeah. we get energy electricity from NIPA and yeah. it's very affordable. But how can we participate in siting renewables in the city and siting storage? Yeah, well, there's your advocacy. There's also your expertise, right? There's so much academic expertise and knowledge here to help throughout the city um, and throughout the state, quite frankly. Um, to your point of storage is going to be absolutely necessary for being able to have or rely less on a base load from a nuclear or fossil place because if you can have storage you can even out the peaks that are coming from solar or from wind uh, and you don't necessarily need that base load from some of the, the traditional providers so the more that you can invest in storage and putting storage on helps to balance out the demands on the rest of the system obviously an obvious place for, for Hunter and for CUNY as a whole is, of course, the emissions, uh, and, and the comptroller talked about it, the emissions of the buildings, right? The buildings are older than perhaps most of the, uh, and many other places, right? And older buildings tend to use more emissions. They're built less efficiently. They're built less of that in mind. The more that you can encourage and we can fund from the state, uh, the retrofitting and the um, improvements of the building themselves to reduce their use of energy and their emissions, the lower the demand is on the broader system as a whole, and that becomes a good way to contribute as well. 
Um, and, you know, I'm also a, a, a co-sponsor of the, the New Deal for CUNY and getting a lot more funding to these systems as well that could help uh, execute that and make that happen. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that. That New Deal for CUNY is the funding that we've been talking about. And, you know, you've supported the BPRA and the Superfund Act. What do you recommend, since we can't just go vote for a local representative, because you're already in support, what do you recommend that we can do to influence the state to, you know, maybe on the Superfund Act, it's as simple as reaching out to the governor, but do you have other suggestions for how we can um, make our voices heard on that? Yeah. Um, well, and there's other bills we still need help on. We need the Heat Act. We need it. So, um, but first of all, I, I, I doubt that all of you live in the 73rd district. So even though I represent Hunter, you should be talking to the people that, that, in, that represent the districts that you live in. If you live in the 73rd, yes, I'm, I'm on all of these bills. Um, uh, but, you know, look up who your local representative is. Look if they're supporting these bills. We can actually, I'm sure you have, but we can share a list of the bill numbers too. And Sending off and reaching out, especially actually, I'd say especially now in the off session, um, because we're not getting flooded as much as we do during session when we just get flooded with these emails. Right, sometimes sending it when people aren't expecting it can have more of an impact um, as people are going to you know their various events and their town halls. I would go, I would ask questions, I would be engaged in that way as well. Um, and the other thing I would say of doing it now versus in session is. All the bill numbers are going to change in session. So every two years, we have to reintroduce every new bill. So there's an advantage to doing it before uh, January uh, for any of the bills that you want to support. And there's also like elections coming up, right? And so people, you know, I'm here in my government role. I don't want to stray too far, but like people that are in tough races appreciate support. And if you, uh, if they are supporting the things you're supporting, even if they're not your local, go out, volunteer, help them out, they'll remember that. And if you're like, hey, what really inspired me to be here was your support of this bill, that will strengthen their backbone. And if those that are not, you know, I would think about that as you're evaluating the decision. I have one more uh, CUNY Hunter specific question. Uh, maybe the people here that could answer it uh, in terms of what Hunter or CUNY itself is planning to do if they get that money. has. CUNY and or Hunter itself. I mean, we talked about solar. Clearly, solar is not enough. It's not going to power CUNY. Uh, it might add some extra power in certain places. Battery storage is fraught with some problems like fires and, you know, storing the, storing the energy. I, I wonder if CUNY has uh, researched, looked into, and again, if you can't answer this question, maybe directly somewhere that uh, I could get these answers, but uh, have they looked into like, thermal energy networks, getting involved in uh, a thermal energy system on its own on each campus's own or joining CUNY as a whole through a thermal energy network that the city could benefit from or, or CUNY could benefit from? Yeah, there's um, there are a handful of uh, research institutes and centers across CUNY yeah. that work on power energy buildings. And um, I've been involved in a lot of discussions about thermal energy networks. It's like super complicated in the dense fabric of Manhattan, Brooklyn, parts of Queens to be able to put together the, the energy network that you need. Um, you, the, the city would have to be the primary owner of that and build most of it in the right of way and then have uh, individual owners subscribe to that network. Okay. So it, it's something that if, if that's how we want to go, and I think it's actually really important that we do go that way, we gotta put pressure on the mayor's office and the city government to actually come up with a plan to do that. During the de Blasio administration, they had a preliminary plan looking at um, siting thermal energy networks all along the coastline of the various parts of the city and tapping the waterways as the heat sink. That would only extend five, six blocks inland, but that would take up a lot of real estate in the city. So those are things that you know, push the city to make it happen. So you, On the larger so. campuses, um, CCMY, Brooklyn College, Queens, there may be opportunities to do localized thermal energy networks there with ground source heat pumps or ground source, you know, uh, geothermal. Yeah. Okay. So that's something, it, again, it, we had to talk with CUNY about what the plans are. We're looking at Hunter. We'd have to tap into a network. We don't have the landscape to do geothermal. Yeah, yeah, right. But other campuses may very well be able to. So, you know, that's why we want to have transparency in the plan and find out what CUNY's planning for decarbonizing CCMY or Queens 
So are they looking at those options or are they just completely relying upon decarbonization of the grid? So, you know, that's all stuff that we got to find out and be involved in the process of doing. Cool, I appreciate that. So it's yeah. more from the mayor's office this way or, or is there a team in CUNY that would then push the plan for we, the mayor's office? No, we, I don't think we have um, organized, we, I don't think we have an understanding of all of the issues involved with thermal energy networks for CUNY to push at this point. Oh, okay. It, once we get the decarbonization action planning happening, we may. We may want to have to partner with the city or state agencies to do a thermal energy network around some of the larger campuses. Okay. That's coming. It's it's not here yet. But I think more broadly, individuals can push the mayor's office to begin doing thermal energy network planning across the entire city for those areas that aren't connected to a large urban campus like CCMY or Queens. Right. And, Sorry and, to take up so much and, time. No, no, no. And we, we just heard from a mayor or candidate. Yes. Who may, yeah. Yeah. may be yeah. a mayor someday. Yeah. Maybe not. We'll find out at the next election. Yeah. 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 I just wanted to, you know, just pitch being part of the uh, the Union of Environmental Justice Working Group. That's exactly what we're trying to do is to build the constituency. And that's what this whole idea of decarbonized community town halls are about. Building the the um, the pub, the awareness of what are some of these issues are, and I've been going to a lot of these, and I'm learning a lot every sure. time, and it, it's it's great, and I've been a climate activist for a long time, but still learning a lot. So I think we're trying to build awareness, it's you know, popular education, but also to build the constituency. You know, you have, you have your uh, email, and we will well, ask exactly. you again. And you know, begin to communicate more. We need to have our own organizational structures united in order to be able to push. And so that's exactly what we're trying to do. And um, you know, I just invite everybody to to you know keep keep posting and keep uh, connected so that we can be more powerful on this. Um, there are a lot of coalitions in the city and in the state that are really valuable to be part of. Um, and we hope that the CUNY constituency will, will be more muscular over time. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. 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 I could say for two more minutes, we're going to have one action, but you might have to get to class. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Ross Pinkerton. I teach at Hunter College High School. Um, and uh, I don't even have to present this slide because Assemblymember Boris already uh, told us all about it. So uh, you um, preempted me in a great way. Although I do want to call your attention to the fact that not only the Ravenswood plant that a professor mentioned, which if you walk to the river, you'll see across the river, but actually on this side, there's a way too old power plant that burns kerosene oh, like it's like practically whale oil so we got to shut that down but as we heard we can't shut it down with no replacement so we have to improve um on the renewables and the storage or whatever the other um you know technical details will be to keep the grid stable so i'm going to send you a link to um, a colleague from the College of Staten Island and the Graduate Center has made a video about the Beaker plant. So I'll send that in a follow-up so that we don't waste your time right now. Um, we do wanna ask you to take one more action. This is really fun, uh, believe it or not, which is to actually call right now to the governor. And if you press one, it's gonna take you immediately to leaving a voicemail. So you don't have to wait on hold. Um, I don't think she has enough staff to take the calls that people want to give, maybe on purpose, but tell her your name, your zip code, and here's what we're suggesting. But now you've heard about all sorts of other things that we want the governor to do, from congestion pricing to um, investing more in CUNY to all these things. So you can personalize it and take a picture and do it later, or really best case scenario, it feels powerful to actually be doing it in community with the other people who are here. So I invite you to do that, and then we are done for the day. I really appreciate you coming. Yeah, you can really do it right now. I hope for a minute.
A giant thank you to all the organizers, especially Ross and Nancy. Uh, and so thanks everybody to, for coming today. Hey Ross, is this a bill? Is there a bill? For this state? It's not a bill because it's already the law. That's the like frustrating thing is the the building those states can get lots of renewable energy at New York Power Authority. We worked for the last three years to make it law, and she's just not. Not doing it. it so yeah for now it's not a law but you could say you know sign the climate change super fund act that assembly member boris said like there's so many laws that we don't even we're not even doing what we said we're going to do yeah she just talked she just talked about it so yeah okay okay yeah thank you yeah thank you yeah great you know Yes, me too. Yeah, I No, I actually am not that Thank you. 